Um, so today I'm going to take the. Um, this is too loud. Fine. Okay. Okay. Today I'm going to take the talk um, one level deeper. So we're, um, and 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 more moving to magnetic devices rather than RAM. Um, specifically, I'm going to talk about compact models. Let me um, get used to this. So the idea is we um, and we've got a series of different projects. I have at Rochester, and one of them is to actually evaluate and combine these devices into an environment where we can actually simulate these circuits. So we actually have multiple technologies we're looking at. And actually, it's an interesting project. It's a cryogenic environment. We're using superconductive technologies that have to drive a magnetic memory in, in cryo temperatures. So it's kind of fun. Anyway, so we did a lot of work in modeling these devices and putting them into a very log environment so we can actually do um, circuit simulation. That was the basic goal. This is uh, the, mother, the motherhood view graph that talks about the values of magnetic memory. Um, you will know this, but it's quite exciting. I'm, I, I see DRAM not living forever and, and, and MRAM um, and RAM are replacing it at different levels of the memory hierarchy, and it's uh, quite interesting. And the CMOS compatibility, as Professor DeMichele said this morning, um, has a lot of potential. You can build it right above it. We just heard it a few minutes ago, and, and uh, De uh, Professor DeMichele described actually a case where you can actually grow right on top. Well, it changes the way we do computing, and uh, it's quite, uh, quite fun. So um, I'm going to talk about these topics. I'm going to talk about basically magnetic tunnel junctions, give a little overview. Um, then I'm going to talk about classical um, two-terminal MTJs, specifically our model for these two-terminal MTJs. Then I'll move forward into a three-terminal um, uh, structure uh, and describe how that can operate, and lastly, uh, summarize it. And again, I'm limited to a 25-minute talk, so it's kind of a, a quick survey. So the basic core idea, and it's a little bit different than RAM, is we basically control the spin. So we have these free layer and fixed layer, and, you can, and it's, a, it's a very nice mem memory because you can force it either to be aligned or not aligned, anti-parallel or parallel. And so if it's anti-parallel, it's, it's a higher resistance state. If it's, it's parallel, it's a lower resistance state. You flow current through that state, you uh, uh, and you set a voltage, and the voltage, if it's high, it's one state. If it's low, it's another state. So it's quite nice. So you can read it by measuring the resistance. You can write it by changing the magnetization of this path. Um, and there are different switching mechanisms. The one that's best uh, known is this STT, which stands for spin transfer torque. Um, there's actually other techniques, which is like voltage-controlled magnetic anisotropy, where you actually apply a large voltage to change magnetic characteristics. Um, and so one of the issues that we'll have, we'll describe in a few minutes, is we actually want to control, we actually want to model these different effects and combine them into an overall model, which is uh, a little interesting. So here's the VCMA technique, and you can actually apply different voltages, and actually you can see how it changes the anisotropy based on the magnitude of the voltages. Um, and you control through the, um, through the easy access. Access. Um, and here's the, the, some of the various mechanisms. STT, we can improve the STT characteristics by adding a, adding a polari polarizer, VCMA, and a hybrid model for it. And you can have different impedance characteristics, different power characteristics, different current densities, and different, very importantly, different switching speeds. And I should point out this is a type low. This should be low. This is not high. This is low. Um, okay. I meant to fix that. The, um, okay, so again, here's the basic um, structure of the, of, the, of the MTJ. It depends upon the switching mechanism, so you have a vertical or horizontal path, um, and you, you control this, the magnetization. It's kind of an interesting structure. So these are the uh, two classical models for the for an MTJ and, and some of the acronyms we use in the structure. So the, the term that people like to use is precession, where actually the magnetization state actually rotates around this axis um, and the, it's, it's a stochastic process, so it doesn't naturally go to any state. And so the problem is it's a stochastic process, so it takes a long time. And so the real trick to this business is to try to increase the, the decision process of this precessional uh, pr uh, process. So we add different states, in, we add different controls to improve the precessional mode so that it goes to a one or a zero more quickly. And that's a, the classic uh, model, the, the, the issue that, that we're trying to attack. So intuitively, it's how to improve the precessional switching. And so there's different dynamic characteristics. We, for at low currents, uh, the damping basically forces it into a state, to a low energy direction. What we do is we add some sort of torque into the device, and based on the torque and the angle and the, and the magnitude, it goes to either a one or a zero state. And so, and we can do that externally, or we can do it internally. And I've left out some materials, but, but if we do it externally, we can, we can force the state quickly, but it takes a lot of material, uh, area, 
we do it uh, internally, then that's the trick. And we can actually get there very quickly, relatively densely. So there's, two, there's, diff there's different configurations. There's, and I'm just again, I'm trying to go over the terminology. There's an in-plane MTJ and a perpendicular um, plane um, MTJ. You can see the differences cl uh, quite clearly. You can force, in either case, different energy landscapes based on the states of zero and one. They have different uh, um, characteristics. The advantage of the perpendicular is a much smaller area, but we tend to use this, this oval space uh, direction for an in-plane MTJ. So it takes a little more area. And they have different characteristics. So the goal today um, is to, given this kind of structure, this MTJ structure, we want to build it into a design flow. Because we're actually moving into circuits now. You can actually buy RM and MTJ kinds of circuits today. And again, this program that I have is a very large scale program and again it's cryogenic and we're using something called single flux quantum for the logic structure but SFQ can't do memory well so we're using MTJ at cryogenic temperatures and we're combining together in this overall system that's the the goal and so in the end we want to do circuit simulation based on compact device models compact applying tractable closed form models um, just that we can do a, a true physical design with design rules and so on something you'll recognize in classical CMOS uh, design flows Okay, so, today, so now I'm going to talk about the, the, the baseline model, which is a two-terminal MTJ. We call our model the Adaptive Compact Model, or ACM. Um, and I describe the model first, and then I'm going to show some simulation results that verifies it against experimental data. So here's the basic structure that we look at, our, our model. So we want to generate thermal, electrical, and magnetic responses based on physical parameters and voltages and currents. And, uh, voltage and temperatures, and these are different modules we've built into our overall model structure. It can do, um, export both magnetic and electrical writing techniques, both the STT and VCMA and a hybrid version of that. So this is a pretty complete model. Um, and importantly, it, it supports both symmetric and asymmetric MTJs. Asymmetric implies that the materials are different in the easy and fixed axis. Um, it considers temperature effects, self-healing effects, so it's a fairly general model. Okay, and here's the basic idea. Um, we basically ba use some of the basic equations. Here's the insulating layers with the polarizing layer, the fixed and, and uh, free layer. Again, two ferrometric layers, a tunneling barrier in between. And, and you can describe it in terms of the, the angles and the magnitudes of the various components of the, of the magnetic fields. Um, and um, basically, by playing around with the different angles, we can allocate both IMTJs uh, and PMTJs across the same models. It's a very general model, which we kind of enjoy. Um, so again, here's an in-plane uh, MTJ with a perpendicular polarizer. Again, I'm just trying to give you some of the terminology. It's kind of interesting. There's a free layer, which changes polarization, and a fixed layer. And again, that's, a, that's another typo for people who see it. Um, OK, so um, and for the PMTJ, now it's perpendicular um, and a fixed layer, and it flows um, vertically. And these use elliptical shaped structures or oval shaped structures. So now, so this model um, basically adapts to these different con um, conditions, geometries, and uh, by playing with the theta characteristics, the angle of the various um, magnetic fields, um, and whether it has a demagnetization field, the in-plane anisotropy, um, and, the, and the orientation of the polarizers. This is this polarizer. Um, OK. And so we look at different responses. So first, we look at the thermal response of the structure. Again, the same core. And so we have basic equations, heat diffusion equations. Looks at the non-zero temperature characteristics, producing this stochastic behavior. So classically, again, it's just, it's just a stochastic behavior based on temperature. And we've uh, incorporated this into our model. We have, look at the magnetic response of the MTJ. And here we use the um, the Landau Lifshitz Gilbert equations to characterize the behavior. These are well known expressions, um, and we characterize and we, we take the expressions and we convert them into um, different forms of the spin transfer torques. There's both perpendicular and parallel torque characteristics. Um, and later on, I'll, yes, sir. Okay, either way. This is another one. Um, okay, but uh, okay, thank you very much. Talk about. Um, so now we also look at the electrical response of the MTJ. Um, and here we actually take the LEG equations, recognize that these two variables are independent, 
and we can then break it down into two, non, two first order nonlinear differential equations to characterize the LLG. And now we have a nice simple electrical node characteristic of this system that we can actually do some simulations with, which is nice. So now we look what we've got. We've got the magnetic response, we've got the, the um, thermal response, and we have a nice electrical model that we all recognize right out of our, out of our EE 101 class that allows us to characterize the, um, the behavior of this MTJ. Okay. So again, I left out a lot of material for the, 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 the time duration, but I just want to show that we verified it. We took experimental data, and we show, in this case, the average voltage as a function of time for both parallel and anti-parallel responses, both on model and experimental results. We ex experimental results, and you can see the uh, accuracy is really pretty good on the order of 6%. This is a case where there's no VCMA characteristics at all, only STT. Um, and you have the, the, the geometries are here. We published it in this paper relatively recently. And the experimental data is the, the lower, lower reference. We actually looked at the squishing phase uh, characteristics of the structure, both parallel and anti-parallel. And again, we looked at room temperature and cryogenic, because that's actually where we we're focusing on. Um, and we had some nice experimental data at the cryogenic temperatures. And again, you see the model is uh, fairly accurate um, on the order of 5% uh, for both direction uh, of switching. So that seems uh, nice. And we looked at an IMTJ with a perpendicular polarizer. Um, again, this is um, primarily STTT, um, error on the order of 4%, against this experimental data um, for different levels of voltages, and you can see the switching probabilities coincide quite nicely with the, experiment, uh, with the, the model data. So that's the idea of the two-terminal MTJ, which is the classic model, and we're actually using this now to build circuits for um, this large-scale program. This program, just to, to stop with, uh, go on a tangent, is the goal is to build hundreds of thousands to millions of single flux quantum circuits um, to drive large scale memory devices, again, gigascale memories, um, to support cloud computing that very, very low energy. I mean, the problem is, the, as we all know, the energy of these, of these uh, cloud, uh, cloud server, of these server farms, um, of these, let me bring it down lower maybe. The, the problem with these server farms uh, is the exorbitant energy that it takes. Um, and so we're looking at ways, and as for people who don't know, single flux quantum logic is, or, or has an order of 1,000 times less energy than CMOS, 1,000 to, to, to 10,000 times less energy. Has, but the problem is you can't make memory. So this is why we're going with MTJ, which is a non-volatile non memory. So together with, with SFQ, it makes a very interesting application for very, very, very low energy um, cloud computing which is the application space, but for the, for the government. So um, now I'm going to look at a three-terminal spin hall effect um, model for the MTJ. Um, this model is particularly for perpendicular MTJs. It considers both field-like and damping-like spin orbit. It's another acronym you should recognize, spin orbit torques, SOTs. Uh, includes both temperature effects on magnetic and electrical responses. Uh, it supports var process variations, and we show that it actually combines nicely with MTJs with CMOS. So um, we sh we've demonstrated this in the various uh, results. Uh, again, here's the, uh, the, the uh, MTJ, uh, I, the PMTJ in this structure, two ferromatic layers, both the fixed and the reference layer, both the free and reference layer, with a tunneling barrier, normal, um, and has a channel structure to control the flow. Um, and here's again the, the diagram to describe the magnetic fields with respect to different angles. Um, okay. So now I'm going to do the same thing and look at the thermal response of this device for perpendicular MTJ. Uh, we look at the joule heating effects on the device operation. So we built in temperature characteristics into the device. We looked at, at the temperature on the, the effects of magnetic fields um, and the effect on the acetropic characteristics for the magnetic uh, uh, characteristics. Um, and we looked at how it affects the conductance, both spin-dependent and spin-independent characteristics. So, so we're, we're looking at thermal effects across all the device parameters. Again, I won't bore you with the equations. Uh, we looked at the magnetic response of the device for, for this three-terminal structure. Again, we used the LLEG equation. Again, we, we, re we recognize the independence of the variables to partition it into two um, second-order linear differential equations. 
And we lastly look at the electrical response of this device. Um, in this case, we describe the, the conductance as being two components, um, both the independent and dependent conductance of the device. Uh, for this is a function of temperature, this is less so. Um, and so we combine the resistivities, and we have now a, a model uh, for the, 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 the structure of it, this PMTGA structure using a three-terminal environment. And, and for Michael, here's your three-terminal device. Um, and so then we want to verify it. So now we, again, um, show the acetropy as a function of current, which is attempting to describe it as a function of temperature. And you can see how the, acetro how the acetropy decreases as a function of temperature, uh, which is interesting. Um, and again, you see that how our model agrees experimentally. Here's the parameters we used from this reference point, and our error is quite good, on the, on the order of 1 or 2%, uh, describing this model against, uh, for temperature as a function um, of the current densities for the isotropy. We looked at the switching phase diagrams of these devices. Um, again, we're looking at magnetic fields as a function of current, um, and we look both um, one direction or the other direction, depending on how we're switching, and you can see at this point it switches, and in, in, e in either case, the error is on the order of 5%. We compare it to this um, experimental data. Actually, no, this was published in this paper. We compare it to other experimental data uh, in the next view graph, and you can see um, here the parameters we used. So we actually actually found a paper that attempted to model MT um, this kind of structure in MTJs, but they had not taken into account thermal effects. And you can see it, what happens if you don't get, uh, include these thermal effects. That's the reference here. But in our case, we were able to include thermal effects, and we have fairly good accuracy on the order of, like I say, about 5%. OK? So that's it. I guess I went too quick. Um, I always go too quick. Um, and lastly is the summary. Um, so we've developed this adaptive compact model. It supports two terminal IMT, IMTJs, PMTJs, and OST MTJs. Uh, it supports a three terminal PMTJ perpendicular structure. We you can use it, and we have been using it to evaluate process variations. I mean, we're, we're, this is the goal is to make it a real circuit design. So we're looking at considering temperature and self heating, integration capability with CMOS. I took it out, but I had a whole section on how we build a register with CMOS and MTJs, where we actually store the MTJ uh, as a, you know, these are non volatile structures. So, so we don't want to have to. Um, worry about maintaining the state in, in the register, so we're able to store the state, flush the register, and then bring it back in. Well, it's right there. So, so the idea is you can maintain states uh, permanently without um, a power supply attached. And again, should have taken it out. So um, we developed it as a Verilog A model. We evaluated it within a Caden Spectre environment. As you saw, we evaluated it against different kinds of experimental data that we found from the published literature. Um, and we have a working model that we actually are using in real time right now develop interesting circuits and complex technologies back in the States. Thank you.